Hello, everybody. Uh, I have perhaps under-reviewed the slides, so I'm dangerous, dangerously un unprepared, but that's great because now I've already embarrassed myself. So uh, the first thing is based on the name of the, uh, the uh, talk that we originally submitted, uh, the developers of the product got a little bit over-enthusiastic and uh, ended up naming things exactly the same as an existing OGC product. Uh, and so if this has caused any confusion, we do wish to apologize. Um, uh, particularly, this was put in by one spatial as a, uh, you know, effort in transparency, uh, because we'd realized after we'd submitted it uh, that when people went through and had a look, they was like, oh, wait, no, that's what, probably too confusing. Um, but the introduction was accurate, that it is a tool for validating against the standards. Um, and this was not intended in any way as a bait and switch, it's just developers got very enthusiastic and were very excited about their wonderful product. Um, yes, so, yeah, but lawyers got involved and probably for the best because we want to make sure that OGC is properly respected. Uh, so the talk will be broken down pretty simply into um, just a couple of points, really, of OGC, what's their role in all of this, uh, and then the actual tool itself, which has been renamed the Essential Geometry Validator Tool, so that it's clear what it is uh, right in the name. Uh, and then there'll be broad sweeping conclusions at the end, because that's a wonderful academic thing that I was trained in. Uh, so if anyone here hasn't heard of the OGC, then you're in for a wonderful, wonderful experience of discovering all the awesome things that they've done. But as a quick rundown, I'll just rattle off a quick, succinct summary that it's a consortium of experts committed to improving access to geospatial or location information, collecting, uh, connecting people, communities, technology to serve global challenges and address everyday needs. So for me, in my humble experience, the OGC is actually the center of innovation around uh, collaboration standards and development for geospatial technology, and particularly having been exposed to a number of different commercial products as well. Without the OGC uh, contributing to the community, uh, essentially much of the technology would still be stuck in the dark ages, because some of the commercial products still are, uh, and uh, or at least trapped in horrible vendor lock-in. Uh, and this is actually why I wanted to give this talk when I was uh, offered this as potential content to present on behalf of One Spatial, uh, because while it is a product that's been developed around some private intellect, uh, as a piece of private intellectual property, it's dependent on these open standards. And these open standards are just absolutely essential to maintaining and preserving the value of geospatial data. And so making this more accessible and making sure that uh, a commercial product is also adhering to that, those standards is just uh, really, really essential. And I particularly wanted to highlight a couple of the aspects of the uh, making location information fair that I believe this product contributes in towards, which is this, uh, you know, findable of, is of course very important as we were hearing about just before but accessible, interoperable, and reusable. As somebody who does a lot of integration, this is a real uh, challenge sometimes to me, uh, finding data that has come from some proprietary software that doesn't quite conform to the standards and makes it an absolute nightmare of building exceptions to try and handle those, that bit of data. And that's almost as bad as leaving it stuck on a hard drive uh, because now it's not actually able to be used and leveraged having had all the money invested in it to collect that data. Uh, and so, yeah, the standards, since they're being created by consensus with a broad audience uh, and without uh, requiring a cost for commercial use, they're more robust. Resistance to over-optimization for a specific uh, sort of knowledge domain uh, and also easy to co-implement alongside other extensions to that in any given system. Uh, and so the, the general sharing of knowledge improves the value of all geospatial applications, no matter which part of the market is within. 
Uh, and personally, I wanted to make the analogy with time zones, which are the bane of my existence, uh, in, and sort of geospatial data rules, validation rules, uh, in the fact that given enough time, no matter how clever I happen to be, I will eventually make a mistake of some kind uh, in terms of some kind of validation logic. And so having a standard to work from that's been cross-validated by so many other people means that uh, it, it helps me to guard against uh, errors that can arise from obscure edge cases or uh, constraints that I haven't thought about before because I've never encountered them uh, and may only be limited to certain domains of data. So why bother to build another validation tool? And essentially, uh, what I would say is that, as previously mentioned, the sort of OGC validator service, which was what the original title of this talk was, is not this product that I'm talking about. Um, that the OGC validator is actually a service for determining if your product that you've built conforms to the standards that have been defined. Uh, this particular tool is around actually taking your geometry files and uh, spatial data and making sure that it actually conforms to the OGC simple feature standard as well as a few other standards and basically trying to harvest as much as possible from uh, the different standards to try and say, all right, geometry, is it good? Uh, and so why build another implementation? I couldn't resist putting a XKCD comic on there. That, and what I would put forward as an argument for this is that if you're willing to put a little bit of sort of that commercial investment behind something, uh, it can produce a incentive towards uh, providing a product that perhaps is uh, more accessible to people who might be less technically enthusiastic uh, to access and understand and maintain some of that high quality data validation. Uh, and so, oh, that, there we go, good. So, some of the arguments, and this is more generally around why bother validating your geometry. Uh, so around decision making, uh, invalid geometry can have serious impact on decisions made uh, both long term such as in urban planning, short term such as disaster management, spatial data analysis and modeling. Like you can uh, have examples of how this might uh, impact things is where uh, some spatial queries will kind of result in what I might term silent failures. Not always silent, silent, but can sometimes escape through to uh, give invalid results as a result of performing some queries with some of the geometries being invalid, uh, resulting in incorrect uh, results coming through to reporting dashboards or other similar kind of territory. Uh, I've definitely experienced this. Uh, and then around resource allocation, inaccurate data can result in the misallocation of resources, much often caused by the similar previous point. Um, and uh, so during things like, for example, critical time periods during, say, a disease response situation, something where the data itself was incorrect and then silently failing may result in resources being allocated into the wrong location for response. Uh, and then my personal uh, area, my, I suppose, favorite failure uh, is integration and interoperability. And this is where the nightmare occurs from systems producing data conforms to the standards 99% of the time. Uh, and then where, uh, the remaining 1% then ends up tripling the cost of integration between two systems because you're building so much guard code trying to accommodate for those occasional edge cases where something is not quite for following the standard that you expect. I've certainly encountered this such as, is a space supposed to be in well-known text uh, at the, between the brackets or not? Point space bracket or point bracket? Some systems have different opinions. Um, then uh, emergency response, uh, public safety and security, economic impact. So a lot of these things can result in, I can't quite read the notes down there, so. I won't worry about going too much into detail there. Um, ooh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, if we 
have an emergency situation and we need to go through and actually remediate the data before we can load it into whatever the system is that's being used to manage that emergency situation, well, that's severely delaying the uh, response and the ability to actually you know, act decisively in that emergency situation. Um, in terms of public safety and security, um, many government programs and agencies are relying on that spatial data maintained by other organizations. And so if you're then exchanging that data, rarely will the data be exchanged between two identical spatial platforms. And so making some means of trying to inject a validation process at many, many steps rather than just once kind of improves the possibility of making sure that that data is conforming to those standards. Uh, and then while the OGC geometry standards are not a silver bullet for data issues, they are an essential step in your data validation uh, process. And otherwise, inaccurate, silently excluded or invalid data can dramatically impact our economic success as a nation, as a people, as the world. Broad sweeping conclusions, I promised. Um, so it is a piece of technology that's been built as implementing the rules on top of a proprietary rule engine, which is why overall it is proprietary. Um, but uh, provide a simple, by being built on top of the proprietary rules engine, provides a simple drag and drop interface for people that are using it to quickly validate uh, a broad range of geospatial data sets. Uh, and then it becomes part of an automated correction process, which can then uh, while keeping the interaction with that validation quite simple so that it doesn't get overly complicated. And that can be quite essential uh, if we're talking about, um, good, I almost remembered what I was gonna say next, um, about sort of people that maybe are spatial adjacent but are still dealing with spatial data and so may not actually have the domain knowledge around geospatial to understand how to resolve an error that might appear in some of their data. And so that's sort of one of the main goals of this tool. Of course, it's also got commercial goals, but I've tried to tone that down for you guys. Um, uh, so in our modern fragmented and distributed working world, the central geometry validator brings a few uh, key benefits. It's cloud, so you're not having to install anything. Basically, anyone can just pull up a browser and start working with it. Um, it means that non-spatial or spatial adjacent staff can leverage these tools to ensure that interoperability and high quality of the spatial data throughout the organization and that it doesn't become inaccessible due to you know, software products changing over time uh, or you know, migrations between different databases or the like. Uh, so the laundry list of things that uh, are being validated uh, so they really, the developers really tried to capture everything that could possibly go wrong with vector-based geometry. Uh, so there's obvious ones like basic validity and uh, simplicity with a capital S. Uh, and then common issues I've personally experienced with some uh, data is users inexperienced with geospatial operations can perform things like a split by intersecting polygons and this results in uh, terrible multi-polygons that have small artifacts like little spurs or uh, things where there might be essentially two polygons but joined by you know, basically two overlapping lines. And this can then lead to all sorts of problems in terms of if that data is then being used for say calculations around like a, you know, a cost propagation or something similar where you might be uh, intersecting different geospatial data to then determine, well, what is, say, a government levy or something similar. Um, and, yeah, it can become a real messy nightmare. Um, so the ease that some tools also allow users to, uh, and I'm not definitely not going to name names, but to add duplicate vertices or duplicate an entire feature or simply forget to stop editing one feature and start thinking that they're editing the second one, resulting in features being uh, a complete mess all over your resulting data set. Um, and so uh, this can really be a major problem. And if you've got something that can clearly identify that, you can resolve that. Uh, and so then, yeah, these some of these extra rules means that you can identify those mistakes easily. Now, a key thing about 
the actual platform that these guys wanted to build uh, in terms of how their sort of uh, proprietary rules engine works is that you can then see graphically what's coming back as a result of your errors. So for example here, we've got sort of highlighted, this is where your error is and they tell me, and I have looked at their platform so I think they're not lying, that the error messages that they give back are actually a lot more comprehensible for somebody that maybe doesn't have a lot of spatial experience. So this actually really becomes something that can feed into like a self-service process to sort of be taking some of the load of something that's as simple as geometry validation off the geospatial staff who have other more complex things that probably are more worth of their time. Uh, and so once a bit of geometry passes the check, it becomes valid. Uh, there are many ways to become invalid, but only one way, one, one path to validity. Uh, the intent of valid is to basically say that knowing nothing other than it is a piece of geometry, the data is the best quality it can be. Now, if you wanted to go any further than that, then you need to get into more domain-specific rule sets, which is because it is a rules engine that they implemented this on, means that the customers of that rules engine can actually extend it. So it's kind of almost getting towards that proper free and open source. Um, and also the product, because I knew people were gonna ask the questions, is that basically if somebody has access to the rules engine platform from One Spatial, then you get this tool as a freebie. So it is actually something that is almost free, but not quite. Um, However, uh, one thing that I really wanted to champion and another reason why I wanted to give this talk was that once you go beyond just does it have geometry, you then have to get into talking through things that become uh, uh, more domain specific for the rule sets. And I actually think this is an area that's maybe I'm just not aware, but would be a prime and fantastic area to build more and more open standards around so that we can start to have more and more of these kind of validation rule sets that maybe are specific to specific kind of asset utilities, uh, sorry, utility assets or specific kinds of geographic assets. You know, a classic one that I heard from this team actually was rivers don't go uphill. And so defining those rules as an open set that then could be implemented by any tool would be quite a nice way to sort of leverage the same way that the uh, OGC simple geometry standards are. But uh, I will, let's go back just one second and just say that, I will say that that is uh, my personal feelings and not a commercial stance TM. <laughs> uh, just to say that's not a message coming from the companies. Good, the GIF works. So um, as the geometry type gets more complicated, uh, more ways of a geometry to become invalid. In fact, the list of applied tests that's scrolling through there is quite extensive. If you Google around for one spatial, you, they do actually have this publicly available on their website to sort of see, all right, what are all the tests that get applied? And uh, yeah, once we get more complex, it starts to get even more valuable to actually have something more visual to be able to interact with those errors um, so that you can quickly get to the root cause of why their data has started to decay. All right, so yeah, there's uh, 3D geometries are also handled in this, uses a different set of rules. Complex geometry, uh, either single or mixed type, is valid if all the individual components of that geometry is valid. Um, and I'm sure everybody will be very excited to hear that there is a, uh, coming soon, the ability to run it directly from within another commercial product. Um, but I did ask whether or not uh, they were interested in doing a QGIS plugin, and they said certainly if somebody was interested in maybe providing a little bit of funding. Uh, so there's there's definitely no resistance there. Just in, you know need to be encouraged for the enthusiasm. Uh, so in conclusion, open standards they're pretty much the cornerstone of making geospatial as an industry uh, work and great. In fact, when I got started in geospatial. Uh, I did not come from any spatial training and I looked at it first and thought, why do people think this is so complicated? And then within a few weeks, I was like, this is so complicated. <laughs> Just because of so many different data formats that we have to deal with and so much complexity around the data, 
So I do think that these open, like I'm not kidding that these open standards are actually, I see as a massive asset. Uh, so I won't do the obligatory marketing message. Uh, and yes, so basically that's the questions that they had at the end, but I think the most important thing is the end because geospatial data should always be fair. Two things. One, one is a remark. Mm -hmm. Why uh, don't you make this kind of product as an open source product? So, so first of all, I think you're at the open source com uh, conference presenting a, a proprietary product. <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, why don't you make it as an open source product? Because it's really something that is of interest. The, the OGC validator is an open source product, and you could, you could actually contribute this type of mm -hmm. developments to it. Um, so th that's the question, mm. uh, and, and possibly also the, the remark. <laughs> mm. So I did quite a bit of work on the slides that I originally got to try and make sure that it was more appropriate for an open source conference, and that's one of the reasons why I was emphasizing so much the, the importance of the standards, because the it unfortunately would not really be easily able to, because it's a cloud tool, be able to be created as an open source thing that could be released, uh, simply because the cloud tool being built on it as a on a proprietary rules evaluating engine means that it's kind of difficult to make that open source and available to everybody. But this is one of the reasons why they basically said, if you have access to that proprietary platform, we give you this as a implemented thing for free on top as a default. So it's. And I, I want to re-emphasize, standards, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because. Next question. Hey. Um, so in regards to the modeling, to the model to set up at, as an open source and um, have it out there, um, mm. in regards to the QGIS plugin as mm. well, um, is there a requirement for a crowdfunding situation or just a sort of a knowledge of how it would be delivered? Like, is there any way that it could, could come to the open source side? I think in the form that it's in, it would be difficult for it to be entirely open source. But I think being able to submit the data and work with the data, so if you were working with predominantly an open source stack, but you had their product as part of it, then you would be able to bring that integration together and they'd be very willing to do that. So Even that if you scale, scale it down and like have a couple of things that are out mm. there open and available, generally, I think, you know, that's generally, I think that's a model that can be worked really well. So I will say that one of the applications of their platform that I'm aware of is for um, data for the a, uh, ASPEC standard, which is an open standard around uh, utility data. And as a result of that, the ASPEC organization has actually purchased their platform and they provide a validator that validates against their data standard but also would include that geometry validator. So that's kind of one of those paths towards semi-open source. Um, but I suppose one of the key points I'm wanting to make is that you can be open without necessarily having to have everything open. 